Folks, hi. Uh, welcome to our commercial space transportation panel here as part of our commercial opportunities of, in space uh, programming track. Uh, we have three distinguished panelists from the cutting edge of the commercial space transportation sector. Uh, Peter Diamandis, who is currently uh, executive vice president of the startup company International Microspace. Uh, which is a uh, which has been around for now how long two years two year old company thereabouts thereabouts two years uh, David Thompson who uh, needs no introduction but I'll go ahead and say anyhow is president of Orbital Sciences Corporation and we have Jim Bennett who is a former president and co-founder of the American Rocket Company and so uh, what we'll do here is we'll have uh, each of our panelists come up and, and talk for a little while about their uh, company, their, their programs, and their view of the future of commercial space transportation. And then we'll have a little Q&A session at the end of their talk. So if you could just sort of write down your questions and hold them until uh, we get done with each of them. So uh, why don't we start off with uh, David here. And uh, please. Good morning. Actually, I'll tell you what, before I get started, I, since I brought along, along, along a lot of these things, let me uh, just hand out um, some background information on um, OSC, those of you that would like to learn a little bit more about the company. Um, I thought Jordan was going to describe us as a startup, too. Peter, yeah. Peter will soon get tired of being described as a, as a uh, leading uh, Executive and startup, and Jim and I are almost outliving that uh, title. I, and I'm not sometimes sure we want to outlive that title, but other times there, we probably do. Uh, Oracle Sciences Corporation actually just uh, had its 10th birthday in April, um, so I don't know whether that means we're, you know, entering into the, the terrible teens or, or something. But uh, uh, we've had we've had a lot of fun, and we've worked really hard over the past uh, 10 years to to create a company that uh, we're pretty proud of today. I always like uh, hearing Tom Rogers speak. I don't know how many of you were in here in the previous session. I think Tom is just great. Uh, uh, we're struggling with many of the uh, challenges that he uh, uh, described. This is a very uh, difficult industry in which to build a business, and as we're finding out, a very difficult industry in which to keep a business uh, uh, going and, and growing once you've got it started. It doesn't really seem to get uh, much easier as uh, we get a little bigger and as the years go by. We focused on establishing a strong uh, market position in, in small space systems, and I think that probably applies to the work that uh, both Peter and, and uh, Jim's uh, companies have, have also uh, uh, worked, uh, worked on. We're engaged in, in two related but distinct businesses, uh, and we call those the, the space technology products and the satellite-based uh, services. Some of you may have heard uh, Alan Parker, who runs uh, the latter part of our business yesterday morning, talk about our WorkCom uh, satellite communications network. So I won't spend a whole lot of time talking about that today, other than to tell you that's really a terrifically exciting project for our company and a, and a big investment. It's a big bet. Uh, we. Unfortunately, it seems, seems like about every two or three years over the past decade, we've had to bet our company on something. And we're now, in a sense, betting our company on WorkCom. And I think it's a, a good bet, not a certain one. It represents uh, an investment of our money of about uh, close to $100 million over the next three years. The uh, first two of what will eventually be a, about a 25-satellite network uh, go up next summer. And if they work as we hope they will, then the others go up in 1994. So uh, we are really trying to, with uh, the ORCOM project as the first of our, of our big satellite-based service uh, initiatives, to uh, uh, develop a service that uh, can, be, can be affordable and useful to a very large uh, number of people in this country and around the world. We're really seeking the first mass marketable uh, commercial space product with uh, the ORCOM system. And others are you know, hot on our trail, so it's a very competitive field. And, Whoever gets there first will uh, uh, have the strongest position, so we're working uh, very hard to uh, try to get there first. What I'm going to talk about this morning, though, is, is uh, uh, the, the first part of our business, our, our core business of, of space technology products, and specifically because this is a, a session on space transportation, 
uh, our uh, launch vehicle products. Uh, let me give you a little bit more background on the company, though, before uh, jumping into that. Uh, we are a leading supplier of, of small space launch vehicles and of suborbital uh, vehicles, and we're a, a strong contender, not, not the leader, but a, a strong contender in uh, small satellite systems and orbit transfer uh, vehicles. Today, we've got uh, about 160 launch vehicles and satellites under contract, one type or another. Some of these are firm contracts and some are options. Uh, with uh, about a dozen different customers, uh, including the, the, the large government agencies that, uh, that Tom talked about, NASA, the Air Force, uh, DARPA, SDIO, the Army, and others, and also some new, uh, newer customers that uh, are uh, putting their, their, their toe in the, in the uh, swimming pool of commercial space to see whether or not they flight the water. We did uh, nine launches of various kinds of products uh, 1990, and we did 13 launches last year. And uh, this year, we're hoping to hit a hit a launch rate of about 20 missions. We've done five so far. Uh, this is the, May is the only month we don't have a launch scheduled this year, and we're staffing up and building the facilities and uh, the management team to support a steady state launch rate of between three and four a month. We're not going to get all the way there this year, but by the end of next year, we'll be very close. Our business strategy has, has really focused on uh, trying to establish a strong position in about a half dozen uh, market uh, segments, uh, relatively small niches of the space industry. The industry is very large. As, as most of you know, last year space spending in the U.S. Uh, represented about $35 billion at, the, at sort of the top of the food chain when you know, end products were sold to ultimate customers. And that's a little more than half the, uh, the world market for space products and services, which was about 60 or $62 billion last year. We focused in uh, market, uh, market niches uh, that support mobile communications, uh, environmental monitoring, certain, certain types of space science uh, and exploration, and, and certain types of uh, space defense, particularly uh, uh, missile defense, both at the strategic and tactical level and uh, tactical applications of uh, satellite systems. And in these six uh, uh, segments, the company has tried to establish its, its uh, competitive advantage in the uh, uh, performance to price ratio or characteristics of our products and in the time to market uh, attributes of those products. And I think that's really been what set us apart in the past from the larger companies that we compete with and uh, we'll have to continue to be very good in those areas to, to uh, uh, deal with uh, the competition that we face today for both established companies and some more aggressive uh, uh, newer companies to the industry. Uh, the com our company's grown pretty rapidly. Uh, over the last uh, nine years, nine complete fiscal years, we've averaged 150% annual growth rate. Now, it was easier when we were growing from $100,000 in 19. 83 in sales to a couple of million dollars in 1984. It's a little harder now. Last year we, we had revenue of about $135 million. We're expecting, uh, well, let me be careful what I say. We're targeting about 30% uh, growth uh, this year. We're not expecting anything. Uh, we've got about 1,000 people on our staff. Uh, between 65 and 70% of our uh, uh, manpower uh, in the engineering and scientific fields. So, so roughly speaking, we have 675 or 680 engineers and scientists. Uh, so far this year, we've, uh, we've gotten off to a good start in addition to uh, five successful missions in a 12-week period between mid-January uh, and, and mid-April. Uh, Our first quarter uh, revenue was up about 37% over the comparable period of last year. And our after-tax earnings were up uh, almost 200%, admittedly from a fairly small base. But Nevertheless, uh, the trend is in the right direction. Uh, with that background, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, our launch vehicle products. We, we, this is really the core of our business. Uh, it's transportation systems represented uh, about uh, 68 uh, or 70 percent of our sales last year, and uh, within a within a, a, a company that's growing at Kind of rates I talked about, they will they will continue to represent roughly two thirds of our business uh, this year. In the space transportation area, the company uh, develops and produces products in three 
lines, uh, space launch vehicles, suborbital launch vehicles, and orbit transfer vehicles. In the area of space launch vehicles, uh, we're probably best known for our, our Pegasus rocket. Uh, Pegasus was uh, developed as a private venture. No government funds were uh, used in the uh, design, development, or testing of Pegasus, although uh, DARPA, the uh, uh, Defense Advanced Research uh, Projects Agency, did become an early customer for Pegasus and uh, provided quite a bit of assistance in getting through the flight test uh, program, which uh, we uh, finished up last year. Uh, Pegasus, as, as a result, is the world's first um, privately developed Earth-to-space uh, transportation system. And uh, it's the first all-new uh, rocket that's uh, been developed in this country in about 20 years to put uh, satellites into orbit. We've got uh, about 60 orders for Pegasus rockets now. And uh, uh, these rockets uh, sell for, you know, something in the range of 10 to $12 million, depending on various factors. Uh, we've had two launches of uh, Pegasus so far. One, the first one in April of 1990, which put two satellites into orbit. One was a NASA spacecraft, and the other was a Navy satellite. And the second launch, which was uh, in July of last year, we launched seven small communication satellites for the Defense Department. The next launch is coming up within the next uh, let's see, six weeks or so. We have a couple of more launches of, uh, of Pegasus uh, later this year. One of the things that's, that's different about Pegasus compared to other launch vehicles is that we don't launch it from the ground, we launch it from an airplane. Uh, we use an airplane to fly as high and as fast as it can go, carrying a 20 ton or soon uh, 25 ton uh, launch vehicle under underneath uh, the airplane. And what that means is we usually get to about 40,000 feet and uh, a Mach number of about a little over 0 0.8. And at that point, we uh, drop uh, Pegasus from the airplane like the old uh, X-15 used to, used to be launched. And uh, off we go on a, about a 10 minute ride that uh, culminates uh, in low, low orbit. Uh, we do this because uh, we found that uh, in small launch vehicles, uh, all, all the companies we're going to hear from today are working uh, against uh, the flip side of economies of scale. Uh, down at the very low payload end, you've got kind of diseconomies of scale as things get smaller because there are fixed weights and fixed costs. Uh, avionics uh, don't scale, uh, the weight or the cost of the avionics system doesn't scale in uh, linear fashion with the uh, payload weight of a rocket. Nor, nor do the cost of the structure, the propulsion system, or any other uh, aspects of, uh, of these vehicles. So we've got to work especially hard to use technology and, uh, in our designs and, and very efficient manufacturing and, and assembly approaches in our operations to really drive the cost down. And we've made a lot of progress in that regard with Pegasus, but uh, we intend to make a lot more uh, over the next couple of years. We found by launching from an airplane, we can just about double the amount of uh, cargo put in space compared to taking that same rocket, the same technology level, and launching it from the ground. And that turns out to be the result of sort of some obvious factors like the kinetic energy and the potential energy that you get by using the airplane, kind of like the first stage. And also some factors that aren't uh, quite as obvious. Uh, you design the rocket motors to operate at uh, lower ambient uh, pressure and you get better uh, specific impulse from those motors as a result. In addition, uh, Pegasus has a big wing on it. it uh, if, you, if, if you're familiar with the rocket, it, uh, it's about uh, 50 feet long and, and generally cylindrical in cross-section, about five feet across. And mounted on the top of the rocket about two-thirds of the way from the nose to the tail is a big delta wing, about 22 feet across, made, made out of uh, graphite composite. We use that wing to really shape the trajectory of Pegasus and fly it like a, um, like a very high-performance fighter air, aircraft from the point of release from the airplane up to the time we drop the first stage in the wing, at which point we're going about Mach 10, and we're at typically 200,000 feet. So it's a, it's a pretty wild uh, ride during that first uh, 70 or 75 seconds. Uh, in fact, on the next Pegasus launch, we're going to have two cameras, one facing backwards and one facing forward on the rocket itself, to uh, really give us a very interesting view of uh, what it's like to, uh, to ride something that uh, uh, flies faster uh, with a wing uh, uh, than, uh, and, and using that wing to generate aerodynamic lift and maneuver than any other vehicle in the 
world, at least unless you believe some of the recent reports in Aviation Week about uh, mystery, mystery uh, airplane that are being tested. And we still want to go faster. Uh, we've, uh, uh, as uh, uh, Peter has done in his work, and as, as Jim and his colleagues have pioneered at AMROC, we've tried to really push technology with Pegasus, not so much to get performance to go way up, but to get cost to go way down. And uh, we're not finished doing that. We're, we did achieve about a three-fold improvement in the performance to price ratio compared to previous existing vehicles in the Pegasus class. That's good, but it's not good enough for the future, so we're going to keep pushing to see if we can get another two-fold improvement over the next couple of years. But we used, uh, in, in the design of Pegasus, uh, very little metal. Um, the way of Pegasus, and you, you count uh, what the structure is made up of, you'll find that about 96% uh, of it is uh, graphite, and about 3% is titanium, is aluminum, and about 1% is titanium. And we did that not particularly because we wanted the strength to weight characteristics of graphite, but because we found that for our application, graphite really became a material of convenience let us drive down cost and make it uh, easier to build. Uh, we also used, a, uh, you know, a, compared to other launch vehicles, a, a very advanced uh, distributed uh, avionics and computer system. Pegasus has three control fins at the back that are like flying tails on an airplane. Each one of those fins has a little microprocessor built into it. I think all together we've got something like 14 microprocessors scattered out around the vehicle all talking to a, to a central computer. And uh, for those of you that follow the program, you'll know that uh, the avionics system, in addition to being anchored, is pretty robust. Um, on our second launch uh, last summer, we had an anomaly at the point of stage one, stage two separation, where we didn't get a complete cut. We cut through graphite. Very few people know how to cut through graphite. We are now the world's experts, I can tell you, after the test program we've been through over the last year in doing pyrotechnic cuts of graphite. We were not the world's experts a year ago, and we got an incomplete separation. Well, what that meant was this thing sort of hinged around like a door, and when the second stage ignited at Mach 10 and 200,000 feet, it was flying more backwards than forwards. So we did a little bit of a maneuver and a little bit of hypersonic stunt flying that, you know, really gave us all heart attacks, and the avionics system got us back on track and we made it to orbit, although we lost about 450 feet per second. We recovered about a third of that by retargeting in real time. We couldn't recover all of it, so we ended up in a little bit lower orbit than we anticipated. We've certainly got a very robust avionics system. I wish we didn't have to uh, prove it through that kind of flight demonstration. We're going to make sure we don't do that again. Uh, in any case, that uh, I think is going to be a very good product for the company. I think it's going, to, it's going to make possible a range of defense, scientific and commercial missions that uh, a lot of people are very anxious to carry out. And we're, we're seeing that uh, with the market response uh, so far to that product. We also have another space launch vehicle called Taurus. Taurus uh, uh, development was initiated about three years ago, and its first flight is coming up in, in the near future. In fact, the very first Taurus uh, vehicle will be a, is in assembly now, and it will be rolled out uh, about the middle of July. So things are going well in that program, although it is still in the R&D phase, and, uh, and uh, we have a number of challenges ahead to uh, make sure that it, uh, it does the job uh, that we want it to do. So those are our two launch vehicles. Uh, last year, those two products represented about 25% of our revenue. And uh, I think they're going to turn out to be very successful ones for us in the future. We also are involved in other transportation products. So we, we are the market leader in suborbital vehicles that are used for defense, scientific, and increasingly for commercial missions. And when I talk about all these launches we have this year, 20 or so launches, uh, two thirds of them are suborbital vehicles. We launch those from various places around the world, uh, places you're familiar with, like uh, Cape Canaveral, Florida, Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, and Wallops Island, Virginia. Places you're probably not familiar with, unless you are really plugged into this industry, like Poker Flat, Alaska, 50 miles north of Fairbanks. We had a team up there all winter waiting to launch a rocket. Didn't launch it until they didn't launch it until March because uh, one thing or another wasn't uh, right for the scientific mission they were doing kind of a hard luck uh, duty spot to be at uh, Martin Fairbanks during January and February. Uh, we also launched from various places out in the Pacific. We launched two rockets from the, uh, from the uh, westernmost uh, island in the Hawaiian chain, Hawaii, last uh, uh, September. And we launched from White Sands and from uh, Wake Island uh, and a bunch of other exotic uh, vacation destinations in the Pacific. 
Uh, we also uh, are engaged in an organ transfer vehicle project, which is very exciting. It was our company's first product. So we started the company around this vehicle called the Transfer Organ Stage. And uh, after a, a very uh, challenging development program to make sure that it met space shuttle safety requirements and Titan three, uh, uh, Titan three requirements and all that, the first couple of tosses have been built and delivered to NASA and are going to be used uh, over the next year to launch a couple of very important missions. In fact, uh, a little, a little over four months, a little less than four months from now, the first toss is going to be used to launch the Mars Observer spacecraft into a heliocentric uh, elliptical orbit that uh, departs Earth uh, on or about the 16th of September of this year and arrives at Mars about 340 days later, which would make it about the middle of July, uh, August, something like that, middle of August 1993, to uh, go into orbit for two, two uh, one Martian year, two Earth years, to, to do mapping and climatology studies of, of Mars. Uh, we also have a number of other uh, vehicles in the uh, production pipeline for other uh, uh, missions. So those are the, uh, the kind of things we do at, uh, at OSC. Uh, I think I've taken more time than I wanted to, so let me uh, end at that point and uh, turn it over to the next person in the panel. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, next, I would like to uh, ask Jim Bennett to come up and talk to us about the AM rock experience. Unlike my two colleagues, I'm not going to be talking primarily about the status or the history of the company, except as a way of illustrating the points I want to make. They're talking a lot about the what of private space transportation today. I want to talk a little bit more about the why of private space transportation today. And I also want to make this uh, related to the goal of the National Space Society, since in addition to my experience in the private space industry, I was, uh, I've been a member of the National Space Society, and it's one of its predecessors, the L5 Society, since uh, 1977. And the goal of the National Space Society, as been stated many times, is the creation of a space-bearing civilization. And I think that uh, it's very obvious that you can't have a space-bearing civilization unless you can get into space. Furthermore, you need to be able to get into space on an available, cost-effective, reliable way. And there's got to be lots of this transportation around. Uh, ten years ago, I, talked, I would talk about private space transportation, and I would make the point that if you're going to have a routine operation, if it's going to be plentiful, available, reliable, and cost-effective, in the long term, it is, has to be a private operation. It has to be a commercial operation, subject to market forces, and financed by profitability. Ten years ago, there was some dispute about this, and a lot of people were saying, well, there's many examples of successful long-term government operation of services. I think that as a result of the last 10 years of change in the world and unmasking what the realities of most of the government-run operations were really like, uh, very, people have, very few people have that illusion anymore. Yet in this country, space transportation is still run primarily by the government. The private activities, uh, although they're becoming much more plentiful, are still on a growing stage. And there's a whole class of activities which is the launch of the large expendable launch vehicles, the Delta, the Atlas, and the Titan, which started out as government contractor activities. And although they're on, on the books, they're on a private basis, it's really a process of taking a government operation and uh, privatizing it to the extent that they still uh, sell to the government. You'll find a lot of government procurement officers and a government, government mission planners that regard that as only as a positive change. It's actually more profound than that. But the whole industry is still in a state of transition. Uh, what we need to do in order to look at whether this transition is being successful, is we have to come up with uh, some metrics of success in the private space transportation industry. Now, there's one really obvious metric of success, and that's whether it succeeds in providing plentiful, cost-effective, available space transportation. It's too, too early to tell whether that's really the case. Most of the launches are still pioneering efforts. Uh, Pegasus is coming up for its third flight. By anybody's standards, that's still in the initial stages of the development of the vehicle. Um, and 
everybody else. Um, all the SSI activities and the other companies are still definitely in a high demand state. Uh, so absent that metric in a large way, you have to come up with other ones. What you have to do is you have to look at other commercial fields of endeavor. You have to look at airlines, aircraft construction, shipping, railroads, highways, whatever, and say, what are the market-like phenomena? And what are the phenomena that characterize this industry? What makes it different from government operations? And then you say, is the private space industry beginning to acquire these characteristics? And that, absent the long-term uh, delivered success, is the way to tell whether you're on course. All right, so what are the criteria of a robust private field? And to what extent is today's private space industry uh, living up to that? I would say that uh, the most important ones are, first, a diversified approach. Typically in the uh, government style operations, you have this idea that uh, you have a committee of uh, experts or mandarins, they look over the entire universe of possibilities and they distill their wisdom and they distill it further, they distill it further usually in long committee meetings and what you supposedly have is a distillation of all the wisdom of the universe into picking the one great final threat path. And of course we've seen what's happened in space projects in the last uh, decade or two as a result of this. What usually you have is the um, combination of the features that everybody wants from their own particular interest rolled up into one rather incompatible vehicle uh, project. And this is something we've seen a fair amount of that. And a robust private field, you don't have this. What you have is a lot of different people using their own judgment, coming up with, in each case, a concerted, focused vision and saying, we think this is a good horse and we're going to race it. And you have a lot of these horses racing. And that was, that's what makes a robust field. It's just the same way that uh, evolution operates in nature. You have a lot of different options, and then you have a selection process. In this case, the selection process is first, technical success, and secondly, the market. And that's what I like about the development of the private space industry. Now, in the post-Sputnik era, in the late 50s and the early 60s, you had a lot of diversification in government programs. People went out, people were in panic mode, money was flowing freely, so Navy, Army, Air Force, NASA, Department of Energy, all over the place tried a million different approaches. And you had a lot of very promising things. And if I go over the list of some of these approaches that were tried, it's going to sound really familiar, because it included uh, taking small solids and making them into small cost-effective vehicles. It included hybrid rockets. It included air launch. It included water launch. It included uh, single-stage orbits. It included wing uh, spacecraft. The whole ramp, including uh, most interesting of all, the Project Orion, which was a nuclear blast propelled reactor to orbit ascent. Now, all of these things were in the process of development, and in the case of hybrids, there were successful static projects. In the case of air launch, it was actually a, uh, an activity which may have been the first successful air launch. You want to be really accurate, Dave, you have to say that you're the first for sure orbital launch from America because the uh, China Lake Name Ordnance Test Station uh, actually did a small air launch off of a, I think it was a 106 fighter, which put uh, five small, very small uh, satellites, which may have gone into orbit, maybe not because they lost the signal and they lost the tracking. No one will ever know. Tracking is pretty rudimentary in those days. Hundreds uh, were a uh, government project at that time. And uh, water launch, there was a, a successful program called Project Hydra, run at uh, Point Nagu by the Navy. Now, all of these things were killed within the next five years because the Mandarins got together and they decided we have the one true approach and we're going to follow it. One of the interesting things that happened with the growth of the private space industry in the, uh, starting with the 80s is that either independently they were reinvented or people went back and looked in the database and dug up and revived these old technologies. Uh, certainly, uh, we at Amarok built our work on a, a predecessor company that some of us were involved in, and we were very aware of the, uh, the Navy experiments in hybrid propulsion. We also knew that they never got the things to work quite right, and we took it back. We dug up some of the uh, people that involved all of those projects and had them on as consultants, and we, we uh, went on from that starting point, and the best that the Navy ever did was a I believe it was about a 20-second firing of a 
35,000 pound uh, thrust engine or thereabouts. Within a couple of years, uh, MROC's predecessor ARC has fired a 42,000 pound motor for 45 seconds successfully, and we were able to do the uh, low level water exit test of the Dolphin rocket, essentially the same type of test that CBAR has been scheduling for the first activity, but has not been able to go off to the um, we did it for less money than we spent it also. But, uh, and then, of course, we went in after that. Uh, MROC was formed and picked up the technology from that point, carried it forward. Today, MROC has done 80 second tests of 75,000 pound thrust rockets and it is now in the process of developing a 250,000 pound thrust hybrid curve tool. Again, be the largest the world has ever heard. Actually, every rock. Every large motor MROC is fired has always been the world's largest hybrid curve. Uh, but this is going to be substantially larger, and we expect that to happen this fall. Uh, that will be quite a milestone in propulsion, and it will have added another option to the nation's technology base. And that's what the private sector is doing. By this diversity, it's adding a lot of different options to the nation's technology base, and that's something the government starts, but usually they feel guilty about it. They are working a lot of different approaches. They feel bad about it. People get up in Congress and complain about duplication, waste, blah, 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 blah. The private sector is a sign of help. And that's why in the private sector these uh, projects get carried to conclusion, where in the government, eventually somebody gets embarrassed and shuts them down. Uh, it's not too bad because then you can take the employees that worked on it and hire them into a private firm and uh, bring the uh, object to fruition. Now, another uh, sign of help is a segmentation by market. Uh, diversity not only means diversity of technical approach, it means diversity of where you think the action is going to be in space and where you think a particular technology has a uh, competitive advantage. And obviously, they looked at the, uh, the market and said, uh, air launch of a winged vehicle has a particular advantage in the small satellite area because there's an obvious limitation of how much you can put into orbit according to how big the available aircraft are along to launch it. So essentially, you're buying your first stage made by the commercial aircraft industry, and you're limited to the choice of first stages which are available unless you have a lot of money to put into development of a very large first stage there. But um, that's been a successful targeting of a niche market. Once you have that niche market available to you, then you can go and look for all the different things you can do with it. You can look, how does, it, how are, how does the availability of this flight allow you to do things that people uh, didn't think about doing before. Combine this with microelectronics uh, revolution, they've come up with ORCOM as one of the fruits of that. That's exactly the process that needs to be happening in the private space industry. And we're going to be seeing, we've already seen uh, the field of private launchers separate out into two different uh, bunches. One is the, the large launch field, which is being addressed by the uh, big contractor firms, which are now have started Meaner, more focused private launch efforts, uh, particularly the uh, general demand commercial launch we have us, but also McDonald, Douglas, and Martin. And on the other hand, there's this uh, other sector of the small launchers, which is dominated by entrepreneurial uh, startup and former startup companies. Uh, and that's another science shelf. Segmentation is, uh, is also an inevitable trend, and when you see it happening, it's a sign of cup, it's a sign of robustness. And we're going to see firms specializing in avionics, firms specializing in propulsion, firms specializing in brokering and market functions, the uh, small standard space platforms companies, an interesting company because they're looking at providing an integrated package of satellite and launch and being the launch broker. Now they describe themselves as a space transportation firm, I think of them as a space transportation broker. Uh, Another different cutout of it is uh, Rick Fleeter's Pack Astro, where they want to provide the combined bus and launch as a single pack to the market. You're going to see people experimenting with all sorts of different packages and combinations and bundles of services. And again, that's a that's a sign of health. It's a non-robust market. You say there's only one way to get into space. There's only one way of conducting a launch. There's only one kind of package of services that are available. It's like AT&T before the breakup. You have any telephone you want as long as it was black, there's and on your table. Or, you know, today you have a multiplicity of services, more than you can imagine, just about. And one of the uh, fun things of starting doing startup companies is having all the business consultants come in and, and 
tell you all the different kinds of communication services you can get, so you have to choose between them. Uh, it takes up a lot of time the first year. Uh, multiplicity of markets is another sign of robustness. In the past, there was one customer of the government, and they launched three or four kinds of functions, and very occasionally they would experiment with a different kind of function. Now we are seeing more and more diversity in types of activity to be done in space. People are coming up with new imaginative things to do. The Iridium is a fruit of the private space industry. The Iridium, because of its architecture, depends on uh, continuous, cost-effective, available, reliable replacement of the spares in orbit. Otherwise, the satellites would have to be too expensive, they'd end up being too large. You just couldn't do the architecture if you didn't have a cheap, robust, available, uh, dependable launch. And that's, that was not imaginable until the private space industry came along. So Iridium is 100% the fruit of the private space industry. You wouldn't see it without it. And as the private industry grows and matures, you're going to see a lot more absolutely new and innovative things that you can do in space. Uh, everything from the Celestis launch of human and human remains to who knows what. It's going to be really interesting uh, next decade because of this. So these different signs of robustness in the market are coming. I believe that if you you look over the last 10 years of the private launch industry and try to look forward to the next 10 years in the launch industry, because of these signs, because of the diversity of approach, because of the, uh, the different types of firms, because of the different niches that are there developing, it shows that the, the industry is on the right track. Now, there's plenty of problems, there's plenty of policy questions that need to be resolved. We, uh, we sure like not to have the government uh, make a decision that inadvertently puts us all out of business. Because it would be, uh, I can assure you that nobody in the investment community would put a dollar in the private space transportation for probably several generations of institutional memory if uh, the government were inadvertently to do that. And there's a couple things they could do, they could do it. Uh, but uh, barring volcanoes and government here to help us, the industry is going to be well established. Now, what's the payoff? Uh, in terms of creating a space faring civilization, uh, the industry that's coming into shape right now, and I'm talking about the institutions, the types of players, just the idea that this is doable. Uh, brokers who are accustomed to uh, doing stock issues for a private space company that makes the whole concept valid in the eyes of the financial community. Uh, lawyers who know how to handle questions that come up from private space transportation. A government office like the Office of Commercial Space Transportation that knows how to license a launch and has thought through the public safety issues in a matter analogous to other transportation companies. When the Air Force or NASA was deciding what to permit in a launch or how to permit it, they just sort of took a guess and said, well, whatever you do, don't embarrass the current. And that was the criterion <laughs> that uh, most of the rules came in on. And the range safety rules are an accumulation of 30 or 40 years of trying not to embarrass the current. And the Department of Transport, well, the trans well, you're with Pentagon in this so I know you think. But the Department of Transportation uh, went in and they said, what's permissible? Well, what do we permit the shipping industry to do in terms of endangering uh, the general public? What do we permit the airline industry to do? All this, and they put them on a commercial-like basis. And that's a whole separate talk, so I'm not going to go into it. But I look at this as like the uh, similar to the first years of the 19th century, when uh, people in the shipping uh, industry got the idea that instead of having random ship owners kind of sail off to the dock and advertise for passengers and then take off, they start shipping lines, and they have regularly scheduled sailings from England to America and back again. They have schedules you can count on, you have timetables, you'd sell tickets, it would be all organized in a structured fashion. Now they did this with wooden sailing ships and the same technology that had been around simply for 300 years unchanged. The British Navy had had warships that were on the books for 120 years as functioning warships because the technology was so static. And it was that static technology they used to start the shipping lines. But the infrastructure was created for Lloyds and the whole shipping industry alerted to accommodate regular shipping. And when steamship time came, it was not necessary to sit down and invent the whole structure to accommodate the steamships de novo. You didn't have new firms. It was firms like Canard that had been established with wooden ships. Or just, they went down to the ship yards and they ordered iron ships, they ordered steamships, and they got going. And in a way, what we're doing is like those first years. The private space industry that's starting now may be using 
rocks that are 30 years old in design. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Uh, some of the new technology that's being started now will be the technology of the future. Others will be replaced pretty quickly. But what I do know is if we're going to see frequent, cheap, available sailings to space from Earth, if the uh, single station orbit is going to work and it's going to deliver the space transportation, we're going to need, it's going to have to be done under private auspices, and the institutions that are going to accomplish those flights are being created by today's private <coughs> space industry. Thank you, Jim. Next, Peter Diamandis from International Microspace. I'm going to try and just keep this uh, brief so you can ask the questions. I think the question part is the most exciting. But there was a question in the second session, commercialization. How do you get a space company going? And, uh, how is commercialization ever going to work? Well, my favorite story for how you commercialize anything is a child's book. It's called Stone Soup. I don't know if you guys know it. I think it's probably the most important uh, message I can convey here. There is a story back in the uh, late 1800s. Some soldiers are coming into a small town, three soldiers. And the people see the soldiers coming from a distance. And they say, quick, hide all the food. They're going to eat all of it. So the soldiers come in and they're going knocking door to door and they say, excuse me, do you have some food? We're hungry. And everyone says, no, I'm sorry, we're out now. It's been a dry season. We couldn't do it. So the soldiers go off and they get a cocky story. They say, tell everybody, we're going to uh, make some stone soup. Would you mind if we borrowed a cauldron and some water and some barley? And of course they said, no, we don't mind that at all. And so the people, the villagers came out with their cauldron and some water and some fire and they made a nice little boil and pot of water. Well, the soldiers said, do uh, you mind if we can get some nice sized stones being about this big. So they went out and found three nice sized stones and put them in the bottom water. And the villagers at this time were all very fascinated by what's going on. I never heard of stone soup. And so they sit there watching carefully and one of the soldiers goes, you know, if we had a little celery, this stone soup would be just that much better. So one of the guys in the village said, sure, here's a little celery. Big one. Next one came over, the next soldier said, just you know, a few potatoes would make it that much better. Well, pretty soon we put in potatoes and carrots and meat and lettuce. And they were stirring all in. End of the day, they were drinking the soup. And the villagers said, this is the best stone soup I've ever tasted in the world. Well, commercial space is a little bit like that. It's uh, getting everybody to kick in their two cents and build it step by step. We've got a challenge in commercial space. It's a challenge uh, in transportation. I have to ask myself, you know, coming to the National Space Society Conference, you know, what's your motivation for being here? What brings you in from around the street? I know some of you from you know, all walks of life. I think space transportation to you is how do you get to space? Or how do we use space transportation for opening that frontier? And uh, folks, it's not easy. Um, space transportation, as uh, Jim and Dave said before, uh, it has changed some in 30 years, but it's a matter of who's been doing it and the rules, the laws of physics remain the same. G level is still very high, and the rocket equation hasn't changed at all. It's tough, not necessarily tough technologically. The politics, you've got infrastructure, you've got finance, you've got a total challenge. Now, where does that bring us in 1992? There's two segments, as Jim said. There's a small launch vehicle side and a large launch vehicle side. Where you all want to get in space, small launch vehicles, probably all of you can uh, make it one of those fairings, but I doubt you want to go up. Large launch vehicles right now are just a bit expensive. We're talking anywhere from 50 to $150 million to get in space. Uh, I wish I'd asked uh, Tom the question I wanted to, Tom Rogers before, which is, where's the first space tourist going to go, and how are they going to get there? Uh, right now, on the technology front, if you look around the room, I'm staring at Jordan for a second, just because the uh, single stage the orbit technology, SDIO, they do, they're probably one of the only technologies out there that is going to allow us to, uh, to break free and to get ourselves up into space. My motivation in all this is to get up into the cosmos. I don't know what yours are. When I look around the room, around the world here, uh, it is damn uh, difficult today in today's climate to expect the U.S. government to mount the type of expedition without the Soviet Union there, without the competition of Japan. So I have to turn then again and say, okay, commercialization, commercial space has to do it. And that's the, if you would, 
answering uh, or going along with Jim said earlier, what were the motivations for going to commercial space is all about? It's trying to build the infrastructure and the drivers for getting out of space. International Microspace is a company uh, similar to, uh, to what David said, we're going out after the small systems, space systems. Uh, we're three years old now. I can probably say we've tripled in size every year, from two people to six, 18. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're on our way up there pretty soon. We'll be uh, uh, firing or hiring the entire uh, population of the planet. That's about uh, 20 years of this exhibition, exponential growth rate. But uh, um, we are out to try and change some of the equations. Most importantly, to try and provide a competition and try and provide a breadth of options out there in the space community. Now, having said that, I'm noting it's five to twelve, five minutes of questions. I'd like to go uh, ahead. We won't get extended. Anybody want to stay? Um, international Microspace, I'll, I'll show that one few graphs. Okay. Uh, just a bit. one rocket picture. Uh, as a company, we're going out after the smallest launch vehicle as compared to the largest launch vehicle. Going after a vehicle whose uh, intention is to put payloads in the 240 pound class uh, into low Earth orbit. We're using solids which are off the shelf, have been in production for years to tens of years, which have a, a damn good reliability. We're not out here to challenge the technology issue, we're out here to challenge the cost and availability issue of space. The Orbital Express launch vehicle is our centerpiece. We're using that for breaking out to space marketplaces. Uh, like Orbital Sciences, uh, one year ago we filed for the FCC for the Earth Orbit communication system in the L band frequency called Constellation, going out after uh, challenging the big Iridium program going along with uh, Defense Systems and Pacific Communication Sciences. What we need to do is develop a commercial space industry. It's not there yet. Hopefully in a couple of years it will be. Remember 10 years ago, today 1982, hearing about 1992. Can't wait for 1992 to come here. It's the big year of space station. Uh, it didn't happen. Uh, quite frankly, commercial space may not happen the same way. We have to make it happen. And it's going to be a challenge, a lot of hard work. But if we can do it, there's great payoffs. Thank you. And uh, if anybody's got any Q and A for our panel here, I can see my hand in the back. For uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, could you tell us uh, two questions? A little bit about the status of OSCs launching on uh, launching from uh, different uh, vehicles like the L1011. And uh, as opposed to the B-52. And uh, secondly, uh, could you tell us how the idea came to you, whether it was in school or uh, before school? Uh, well, let's see, taking it in order, uh, as uh, most of, as many of you may know, we've been using a uh, NASA operated uh, B-52 aircraft as our launch platform for Pegasus. Uh, uh, over the last couple of years, and we'll continue to use it until about uh, this time next year. At that point, uh, uh, we'll, with, uh, uh, you know, in a real sentimental way, we'll bid goodbye to the B-52 and start using our own airplane. The B-52 is a great aircraft, uh, but it turns 40 this year. Uh, it may have already done so. I think it was you know, rolled out in the spring of 1952. Uh, so it's older than you know the, our, the average age of our engineering team by about seven or eight years. It also has some operational uh, features that make it not terribly flexible. Flaps don't work. Uh, I can't fly too far before it needs a new tank of gas. Avionics are kind of old. So we're uh, going to be using our own airplane uh, beginning next summer. Uh, there'll be some differences. Uh, exactly how we attach Pegasus to the airplane. It won't be under the wing, it'll be under the fuselage, and the airplane will fly a little higher, fly a lot farther than, than that B-52. Uh, 
Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it's, it's been a great airplane to use, and we really appreciate NASA's willingness uh, four years ago to entertain this crazy idea of launching rockets from their, their uh, one and only uh, B-52. Uh, the idea for the company, I guess, had been rambling around in my head since uh, 1978. I do remember the specific uh, day it occurred to me to do this. Uh, uh, I was outside working, it was in the summertime, it was down south, it was really hot. I don't know, if, you know maybe it was just uh, something I should have gone inside and you know, had a big glass of ice water and taken a nap and it would have passed. But anyway, I didn't do that. And, uh, so uh, one thing led to another. And I met a couple other guys that were equally crazy about uh, uh, doing this. And uh, we determined in the spring of 1981 that we were going to do it. And then it took us about a year to really get our courage up. And, uh, Quit, quit our you know, day jobs, which everybody advised us against doing, and uh, start the company. So the idea has been around for a while. It was after engineering school, but before business school. Okay. I'd like to ask both uh, Peter and Dave how they thought the uh, influence or their association with another larger uh, aerospace uh, company, I guess, in the world sciences case, was Berkeley. How did those help you and how did you get into those arrangements and recommend that as a as a formula for other small entrepreneurs to, to succeed? Um, I'll give you the give the poison question for you or image in a different way. Uh, space systems cost you anywhere between uh, 10, 10 million ten billion in some cases to ten million hundred million dollars to uh, to start coming there as your engineer or businessman and you say finance person would say, I'd like to borrow $30 million, please, to get a company going and want to build this. And the person says, well, how much experience do you have in building rockets? How many have you built in the past? Uh, I think it's absolutely mandatory right now. If you have a big brother, a uh, large corporation, um, mostly reduce risk and provide insured source components. Uh, it's uh, probably the only company out there that's that's uh, breaking from that and is uh, congratulating them for what they've done has been a colleague down at the table, American Rocket, who has uh, really broken uh, some uh, framework concepts and gone out there with a team of 15 or 16 people and built their own rocket motors and another team of 15 people to stack up um, a vehicle. It's been amazing. Quite frankly, had their uh, had a bit of humanity and not gotten to the first battle, I think uh, now not would be job on the launch vehicle side, and now, quite frankly, we're all hoping that they do a tremendous job on the uh, propulsion side to challenge some of the propulsion costs out there. And to get to your question again, I think it's a, it's a formula which has which worked very well for OC's case. Uh, ask me again a year from now, I'll tell you if it's very well in our case. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think uh, Peter says, says it very well. I think these guys are about to... Uh, uh, get to the point where a number of us are going to start buying their propulsion systems, and I think that's going to be terrific for the industry. We're um, we're also, you know, well, the structure of the industry is when you start looking at the guys that build propulsion systems or avionics, you know, mostly you're going to find relatively big companies. We do deal with a couple of smaller, pretty young outfits and some of our attitude control systems and, and our structure. Because we found that these guys are really just top notch at what they do. Uh, our composite structures, many of them come from a small company called Scale Composites based out of California. We buy uh, attitude control systems for our satellites called uh, Space Sciences uh, Corporation in uh, New York. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, on the other hand, uh, with Martin Marietta, with Hercules, with Hughes, probably with others, I'm not thinking. We've had good um, partnerships with the bigger companies. Sometimes there are, there are peaks mismanagers. You know, they want to do things a little faster. They can take a little more risk. They want to think things through a little more. And uh, um, you know, sometimes we, we argue and have arm wrestling matches. But what I think the results have been really favorable so far for us, and I think for our partners, I, at least in the three cases I mentioned. I know. 
precinct voters are behind these guys. Could have gotten in today. Not quite. I would just like to add that in addition to the other uh, metrics and things you look for in the increasing private development of the field, one of the things you see is a combination of the old and new. Because as the old companies see the environment changing, the smarter ones begin to adapt to that environment. One of the things they do is form partnerships with the younger innovative companies. And we expect to see this happen. We expect to see it more. However, it's interesting and ironic that one of the first uh, link-ups between the old established contractor firms and young entrepreneurial firms was where the young entrepreneurial firm bought an old established contractor firm, which they did a couple years ago. And you're going to see uh, these creative link-ups happen in both directions and maybe some other directions you haven't even thought of. But you had absolutely no cultural mismatch associated with it. So I <laughs> three options of the sum. The third one is hybrid. I had to find out how, to what extent each of you feel you could soak in the future for reducing a specific launch cost cost of a cost of kilogram. Would that take an option that common sense and tops that maybe applies to the future that was a hybrid? But just a lady, the bottom line question is how cheap could things get the hybrid? Perhaps you can like uh, the question about how cheap things can get with a hybrid engine is not so much a question for straightforward engineering, because it's theoretically possible to reduce some of the unit costs with solids or liquids as much as rather how much can you change the operations, the whole setup from beginning to end. And the newer the start of the company, the less you're invested in an old way of doing things, the more savings you're going to realize from a hybrid, because what it means is your manufacturing plant can be cheaper because you don't have this explosive mixture being handled on the premises. And Amrock's always been able to operate in light industrial zone facilities. We've operated near trader parks, schoolyards, etc. Once you know you calm down the fire marshals and explain what's really happening, they were uh, they were perfectly happy to make this happen. They've had to eat a few fuel samples in front of them. Uh, this is a safe house. <laughs> right? And uh, likewise, when you get up to the launch pad, once you actually convince the Air Force radio safety officers that this thing really won't explode, they'll start letting you do things that save you a lot of money in the operations. Uh, if you were, for instance, to use hybrid as a replacement for the shuttle solid rocket booster, I think it would save something like 37 out of 150 days of processing the motor inside the assembly facility because there's a lot of critical steps where you have to clear the facility of all unnecessary personnel because of the safety steps, and that might take that takes days and days out of the processing flow. With hybrid, you don't worry about it, you just let it happen. Uh, so that's a roundabout way of saying that hybrid can deliver substantial cost savings in an actual launch operation. Uh, how much of the savings you get, you can't tell until you've really gone through and reconfigured the operation. Part of it is uh, these really uh, difficult to describe things like to what degree you can really uh, convince the range safety officers that they can go back and change some of the old standing rules because they're no longer necessary for safety. Um, the best situation would be to have an entirely new uh, private spaceport where the rules were designed, the facilities were designed from the start to take advantage of these uh, capabilities. However, uh, some of the calculations that our chief designer, Bevan McKinney, has done is that hybrid propulsion ultimately might be able to get your cost down below $1,000 per ton for launch, perhaps as low as $600. Uh, let me add, I just add a couple points there. Just for putting some numbers on the table for reality factor. Uh, in an average launch vehicle, if you look at uh, uh, Pegasus or Orbital Express, whatever the case might be, uh, your propulsion costs are going to end up being somewhere between uh, 30 to 45 percent of the vehicle. I don't know what you all think rocket motors of a vehicle cost, but by the time you add avionics and guidance and uh, your overhead and people and range costs and structures, propulsion constitutes about 30 to 45 percent. That's the, the lowest and the highest I've seen. You can nod your head down that one. But if you even cut propulsion cost in half or bring it down by a, a factor of five, uh, you are not bringing a vehicle which costs $15 million down to $2 million. You're bringing from $15 million down to $12 million or $11 million. So just to keep that in mind, what, what Jim said was very important is you've got to change a heck of a lot of other things besides just propulsion. Uh, and then hybrids on top of that are, uh, are top-notch for a booster for the first stage of the vehicle. Uh, 
For a second stage, you probably want to use a very high mass fraction solid. For a third stage, you probably want to go to a liquid system. Um, and all an all hybrid system has the difficulty top end. So then you're even changing not 35% of the equation, you're changing 15 20%. It, it's it's the right step, and, and I do look forward to that you will use those in the future, but it's not the full solution. How many of you have to be a good price to the percentage of 55%? Volume. <laughs> Volume. Volume. All right, we'll take out about two more questions here, and then we have to get off. Yes, sir. I had a question for Jim. I was wondering how much longer into the future do you test launch vehicle on the launch pad to try for a successful launch of a hybrid launch? Uh, that's dependent on a number of factors, uh, funding uh, deals and other things going on, which I'm no longer going to attempt to predict. But I would like to, uh, I would like to think that we may see a hybrid flight demonstration uh, of a large hybrid uh, motor within two years. I heard there was a successful small hybrid launch. There's been a couple of successful small hybrid launches of the like, large amateur rocket cities. And that's now getting to be pretty well known. Uh, technology costs a lot of money to develop. Uh, how much have you used NASA's technology in developing your products? to know whether, whether to label something as NASA's uh, technology or the Defense Department's technology. Uh, there are certainly some cases where we've taken um, a component or maybe a subsystem and just pretty much pulled it right off a production line that was originally started up by NASA or DOD for an inertial measurement unit or a, a battery uh, or something like that. Um, most of the, well, in some cases, we've also used rocket motors that have come off uh, government programs. Although increasingly, with the stuff Jim's doing and some other things that uh, we're pursuing, pretty much developing the, at, at that level, at the subsystem level, the propulsion subsystem, uh, developing new things. Although when you look into them, you still see that uh, well, the case material or the insulator or the thrust vector control system came from. Military program X or civil space program Y or you know commercial space program Z, uh, and some of the stuff we're finding most interesting is coming from completely out of the traditional space industry, where we're taking something that was developed for you know a tank or uh, or for just uh, commercial electronics, and saying well you know this wasn't adequate maybe five or ten years ago for space applications, but a lot of things have changed, and now it probably is. So we're using whatever technology looks like the right one, and some of it does come out of NASA-funded programs, and some out of, you know, things completely outside of our industry all together. All right, well, I, I think we've run out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists once again for coming out with, and talking to us this morning about uh, their companies and their views on the commercial space transportation market. Thank you very much.